not sure how many of you recognize the city. That's the map of London. London. The red spots indicate where there have been lots of uh, Flickr photos. And the blue spots indicate where there have been lots of Twitter photos. And somebody just put them all together and said, what does the city of London look like if we do it this way? So there are the red spots, which are clearly the tourist spots. So that's the Tower of London. Yeah, that's the Tower of London. Uh, that's the Buckingham Palace, and so on. And the blue spots are where there's more news being made. This compresses, I don't know how many uh, hundreds of thousands of photos and hundreds of thousands of tweets just based on a geographic perspective. But it's also telling you a story. It's saying that's where the business district is located. That's pretty much where the tourist spots are located. This, that's a, this spot, that's a combination of both, is Oxford Street, which you know, is the biggest tourist and business area that's out there. In fact, it also told me a few spots that I hadn't been to that I should visit. Primrose Hill, for instance. You know, what's this bright red spot there? Let me go there and have a look. And it has this amazing view of the entire city of London. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about is stuff like this. How you can take data from crazy places, put them together in a way that you would not have normally thought about, and try and get something new. Data visualization is really about telling stories with pictures. <coughs> A bit about myself, my name is Anand. I have chosen the designation of data scientist at the startup that we founded. It's Granda. And I'll begin with an introduction to what data visualization is, how it started, a bit of history, what kinds of visualizations can be produced, how you can learn more about it. That's for the first half. And then the second half, I'll go through some examples of how you can create data visualizations in JavaScript. It's actually extremely easy. Once you get to know the basics, you don't need a library, but I will be talking you through some libraries if we have time. Data visualization actually started had surprising origins. This is probably the first popular data visualization created, created by Florence Nightingale. Uh, her contributions to the nursing industry uh, actually went well, actually her contributions went well beyond nursing. Uh, one could argue that she is the founder of modern data visualization. This is a chart that she put together for Queen Elizabeth. The black areas show how many people died in the war by getting killed in the war. And this is month on month. The pink areas showed how many people got killed out of related causes, war related causes, but not quite when they were fighting. And the bluish gray areas showed you how many people got killed in the hospital just because they were not getting enough medical treatment. She got her funding, Britain won the war. She got her funding for the hospitals, and Britain won the war. That's a map prepared by uh, C.P. Snow. Uh, he was a medical <coughs> practitioner. He was trying to figure out what was causing the cholera breakout. His theory was it was the pumps that were infected, and he went to the he went household by household, mapping how many people had cholera infections in those households and how far they were away from the various pumps and which pump they were drinking water from. Now, so that's the number, so each line is the number of people in that household who had cholera. And he plotted this for a fairly large area and centered down to this one pump. That was the main cause of cholera. Geographic visualization in the 18th century. There are many more. This is not something that is new. The point is, if they could do it in the 18th century without computers, you can do it very, very easily. The thing that's stopping us or the thing that we need is not as much an awareness of technology as much as an awareness of what data visualization is and what it can do. Let's take this table. <clears throat> I've got the sales and price of a product across four cities. So let's say it's a bar of soap that's being sold across various cities that we, and each of the cities, uh, the branches of the cities have the flexibility to change the prices as they want and as the price changes, the sales varies. Now, Bangalore, the average price was 9, the average sales was 7.5. Delhi, average price was 9, average sales was 7.5. And so on for all the other cities. If you look at the variance, which is the square of the standard deviation for those that are familiar with it, that's the same as well. It looks like the same, you know, the cities don't really seem too different. I'm going to plot the same data set. Delhi, the sales rises with price and then falls after a point. Bangalore sort of increases, but it's not a very strong correlation. Hyderabad, you would argue that it's almost a perfect correlation except for one, what looks like an aberration. 
and Bombay, they never even change the price by one point and you would argue that that's not enough data to conclude anything. Descriptive statistics can be very misleading. <coughs> if there's, you know, there are a few points that you might want to take away from this session and if there was one really strong point, I would simply say, don't bother with averages, whatever the data just brought it. There is far more that you can take out of a plot, no matter how bad a plot. But particularly something that shows every single point rather than summarize it into a smaller data uh, into a smaller data set. Just plot the full data set. See what you see. And invariably that will lead to better insight than anything else. Now, some of the work that we're doing involves pattern detection. Uh, so we an energy utility approached us and said, look, we know we have a lot of fraud happening in our meter readings. Uh, we've been pushing for automated for automated meter readings, but uh, there's a lot of resistance from the union and we need some kind of proof. And we're going to be showing that the unions so don't expect any sophisticated statistics to sink through. Uh, you're going to have to keep it as simple as possible. And we'd also like to find that evidence. So we took the data, it's fairly large, 180 gigabytes, uh, which had the meter reading for every single person for about 12 months in that state. We said, let's do the simplest thing possible. Let's plot a histogram. That's the histogram of the meter reading for every single person in the state. The number of people that have a meter reading of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on. And you see some spikes. That's a you know, perfectly long, smooth, long normal curve except for those spikes. Those spikes primarily happen at 50 units, 100 units, 200 units and 300 units. Which is exactly the number, the, the meter reading that people need to have to stay within the slab boundary. If you have one unit more than 100, then you get into the next slab and therefore pay at a higher rate. Now, that is fraud. But incidentally, we were also talking to this guy and said, look, we can understand the economic reason behind why 50 units and 100 units and so on, because like, they, if it's any higher, then they get a penalty. But what are the spikes at 10, 20, 30, 40? They said, okay, he said, take a guess. We had no idea. And he said, this, it's, this proves something that we've for a long time had a suspicion about. This is not fraud, this is just laziness. The guy never went there. He's just putting a round number for the meter reading. It gives us an even stronger case to push the automated meter reading. We tell him, look, you aren't even taking the meter readings. What's your problem? Then we looked at, for instance, is this correlated? So, for instance, this is the same set of people that are having the meter, uh, you know, that have the meter readings of 100 and so on. So, for instance, there was this lady whose meter readings were 200, 200, 200, 200, 200. I mean, that's really hitting your energy meter to the right level, either that or fraud. Uh, incidentally, when he went through the list of names, he said there's unfortunately not much that we can do about the names on this list. They happen to be somewhat influential people, but it's good to know where this is coming from. <laughs> and also, we looked at it from uh, in, in different regions. So, uh, we took one city and within that city broke it down into section and tried to see this excess of fraud that you see. So let's say this is about 40% higher. Does it vary from place to place? So in you know, section 1, is it how, how much is it? Section 2 and so on. So section 1, this excess was about 70%. So treat that as roughly 70% fraud. 97%, 136%. So whereas some sections have relatively lower levels of fraud, 9%, 15%, 30%, and so on. So you also know where the problem is focused. But also there was one anomaly. Section 5, that's a bit of a dip. Uh, all of a sudden, the degree of fraud drops then stays a bit low and then spikes up after a point. So this guy sends a view over, pulls up a uh, register, looks through it and says, ah, Soma Sundaram got transferred in, in June and got transferred <laughs> out in September. <laughs> now I know what to do with a pile of complaints against him. Stuff like that. Uh, <coughs> or another case. Sure. Sorry? Please. Yeah. So the second chart was prepared from the first one, uh, we had a huge data set which said this is a customer. In this month, they had this meter rate. And we also know from, for each customer where they live, in which section they live. So the second chart is the fraud percentage? The second fraud is the excess, the uh, height of this chunk divided by the height of this chunk. Okay, thank you. Now, if you notice, this does not involve any sophisticated graphics. You can do this in Excel. In fact, we did do a version of it in Excel also because those guys then wanted to replicate it. So, part of data visualization is not about the sophistication of the graphics. It's really about the sophistication of your imagination. Or not even sophistication, it's about the simplicity of your imagination. We will be covering how to do some of this in JavaScript, but just keep this in mind as well, that you don't really need sophisticated graphics. 
Another one, this is again, uh, uh, this was with uh, the financial services provider, where they said we want to understand some patterns in securities, be it currencies, be it commodities, be it stock indices. They put this piece together. Now, that's a set of currencies, commodities, stock indices. And what each cell shows is a correlation between a pair. So, for instance, 68% is a correlation between the Australian dollar and the euro. And that's colored slightly green because that's slightly positive. And wherever you see red values, those are negative numbers. What you also have here is a scatter plot. So, on any given day, and this was over a period of six months, on any given day, what was the Australian dollar price? What was the euro price? And you can see that in general it moves up. Now, why is this important? Because, well, you saw the earlier slide where <coughs> you saw some patterns are not always obvious from the number. Now, we've seen cases where, for instance, uh, specifically, uh, gold versus Swiss franc. Uh, gold versus Swiss franc has this moment where initially it goes up and then it goes down. So, the correlation ends up being close to zero. But then, uh, with gold versus some other currency, I forget which one, was completely all over the map. That also had a correlation of zero. So, a correlation of zero can happen from two, two, you know, for two completely different reasons. There was a period when it was strongly positively correlated and then strongly negatively correlated. Okay. And then another is where it was just completely neutrally correlated. You've got to see some of this to understand the real pattern. So we plotted that and found that there are, you know, there are blocks of correlated currencies. The Singapore dollar, Japanese yen, gold, Swiss franc and Chinese yuan. They tend to move close together, very closely with each other. And this is another block. The uh, S&P, the FTSE, the BSE Sensex and for some reason the Pakistani rupee tend to move fairly close to each other. And also, when one block moves up, the other block moves down. So when any of these currencies go up, these indices and this currency go, goes down. <coughs> you can sort of see that, and what that therefore means is if you're holding a lot of gold, what's your best hedge against gold? If gold goes up, what goes down? <laughs> your best bet is probably holding the FTSE. Hold an aggregate of the British stock index, that's your best bet. If you hold a lot of Indian rupees and want to hedge against that, not much that you can hedge. Your best bet is probably the Japanese yen, which is going to drop by around 27% if the Indian rupee rises, but more importantly, the Indian rupee drops, it'll rise up a bit. But there isn't as strong a hedge against the Indian rupee, at least in the prevalent in the prevailing conditions. Stuff like this, I'm not going to go on more into the details. I want to give you an idea of just two things. A, data visualization is old and fairly simple, does not require much by way of technology. And that B, the things that you can do with it do not require uh, much by way of tools. You can do them on Excel either. But let's dive in into, or before I dive into the demo, just want to mention, in case you are looking for further reading, look for any book by Edward Tuft, T-U-F-T-E. He is the be all and end all of data visualization, and any of his books would I mean, just read them. They are they are beautiful to read. And these are relatively old books, meaning eighties, you know, uh, one of them was in seventies. And don't talk anywhere near about anything about the technology. They tell you what kinds of visualization one can produce. But now let's dive in into a demo of a simple data visualization. Uh, I pulled out from an ISP. Uh, data about when people do this. <coughs> so what I got was in each city, that's the third column. So in each city, at what hour of the day and at what day of the week do people browse and roughly how many of them were there. Okay. Now let's try and see if we can create a visualization out of that. We keep it simple. Uh, this, uh, what I'm going to do is create a visualization that has the seven days of the week and the 24 hours in a day split up as a grid and depending on the number of people in the cell I'm going to vary the intensity of the cell. Any guesses on how you would do this? Heat map. Yeah, this is a heat map incidentally, yes. Any guesses on how you would do it using HTML and JavaScript? Tables. B3. Tables. B3. Canvas. Rotovis. Rotovis. Rafael. Simply RGB. Simply RGB. SVG. So, SVG. So, two of those answers were technologies, two of those answers were 
techniques and three of them were libraries. Let me walk through those. So we have SVG, which is a way of drawing on the screen. And we have Canvas, which is another way of drawing on the screen. We have Protovis, we have Raphael, we have D3, which are libraries. And we have tables and we have RG, which are techniques that we would use to draw on it. We'll start with the simplest. Uh, I'm not even going to go as far as scales. <coughs> what I'm going to do is make each one of these a div element. It'll have a width of 50 pixels, it'll have a height of 50 pixels. The position will be depending on the R and the, depending on the day of the week, it'll be positioned at some location. And the position is very easy to calculate. It is simply R times 50 and weekday times 50. That is the X and Y coordinate. Width is 50 50. The color we'll have to work out. Now, let us assume that the maximum range for this is 2 million visitors. Uh, in that R. So we say 2 million visitors will represent bright blue and uh, 0 is white or some color range like that. Let's walk through the code that could be used. Now, uh, first thing I've done here is copied and pasted this text. Okay. So uh, I just filtered Chennai and for Chennai, copied this entire chunk. I can do it in front. Uh, this, I don't know why this is here. Okay. So I just pasted this. Now, I'm going to comment out everything that I've got here. In fact, I'm going to delete it. Let's see what this looks like on the browser. No, that's not what it looks like on the browser. I'm going to reload it. So. Sorry, I'm changing the wrong one. <coughs> yeah, that's the data. I'm going to remove all the scripts that I put here and show you what it will look like to start with. Fine. So we've got this data set. Now we're going to transform this into the key grid that you saw earlier. Let's walk through the steps for doing that. Now I've included Two libraries. One is jQuery, mostly because I can't live without jQuery, but you don't really need jQuery for this. Uh, the other is a very simple library called color. What I can do is transform a number into a color. And I'll walk you through that library. It's just code, 20 30 lines of code, and it's very basic. Think of it as given a number from 0 to 1, it will convert it into RGB from any state to any state. You could just as well have <laughs> replaced it with RGB of 255 times value, comma 0, comma 0. Now, what we're going to do, what we do is take the print, which is where we've got all of the data, and we convert it, we convert the text into an array of arrays. So, this data variable is an array that contains the lines split based on the new line, and what we do is split it based on spaces and return an array. So, the first array, sorry, uh, let me show you what data looks like and is. the numbers or the columns that we've got. So first one was 0, which is the day of the week, the second is the hour of the week, the third is the city, and the fourth is the value that we have, and so on. So now that we've got the data extracted, and incidentally, the way I'm doing it is possibly the worst way of doing it. You will typically source data as either a CSV file or a JSON file. If it's JSON, you don't have to do anything. If it's a CSV file, there are enough CSV to JSON passes. Please do not write code to do any of these transformations. <coughs> That's important enough to say that please do not write code to do any of these transformations. In fact, in general, please do not write code. Code is a library. What you want is a functionality. Someone's written it already. Why bother? Right. End of rant. Uh, then, now what we're going to do is draw a box. Now, first, I create. Uh, okay. So 
now we create a grid. This grid is just one big div that's going to have everything in it. And then for each row in data, we are going to do the following. We create a div and we add a class called cell. Now cell is simply a, a div that is absolutely positioned, has a width of 50 pixels, has a height of 50 pixels. So instead of having to specify that explicitly, I put that in the style right on top, somewhere on top. That says that a cell is an absolutely positioned element with a width of 50 and a height of 50 and a nice black border. Now, then we say position it so that the left is 50 plus, I'm just leaving a little gap of 50 on the top left, plus 50 times the row of 0. The row of 0 will tell me how it is positioned horizontally, which happens to be the R of the table. Then the top position is just start at 50 and 50 times row of 1, which is the R of the table. So it's positioned each cell at the right location. And then I put in a background color. The background color uses a function that's defined in color.js. And I'm saying gradient of row of 3, which is the number of visitors, divided by 1 million. Because I happen to know that there are roughly 1 million, or the maximum number of visitors in any R is 1 million. Now you ideally ought to do this programmatically, but I'm just keeping it simple. So therefore, this number is going to be something between 0 and 1. <coughs> and this reds is a, grade, is a gradient palette that has been defined. Now, if we just did this and then uh, ignore this line for the minute, data of value comma row, and just storing against each cell what the original data is to look it up later, we'll come to that, don't worry about it. We take this entire div that we just created at that location and add it to this big grid. So, one by one, it goes through the row, uh, it goes through the data and plugs it into the right spot. Now with that, we have this visualization. Sorry, you know this little thing that pops up, I'm going to show you how we did that. But that's what we have. Now, let's spend half a minute looking at what it's telling us. Firstly, it's telling us that people start, well, this is 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, let's say, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and so on. 3, 4, 5, 6 is when a few people wake up, 7 is when more people wake up, 8 is when they really start browsing, and so on, so on, so on. It goes on almost till 10 in the night, at around 11 in the night is when the traffic starts dropping. And if you look at it, there's a slight, uh, it starts a bit later here, which is on weekends. Also, tells us that people like to sleep a little more on weekends. Now, we then took this to the next level, if you got it, look, maybe cities are different in their behavior. No. Let's take Bombay, let's take Chennai, let's take Delhi, let's take uh, <coughs> and try and see how these cities differ in their browsing behavior. Well, there are two factors in which the browsing behavior was different. How early they wake up and whether they work on weekends. And it almost falls into a clean 2 by 2 pattern. <laughs> Bangalore and Chennai wake up early. Bombay and Delhi wake up late. Bangalore and Bombay work on weekends. Chennai and Delhi don't. I leave you to draw the inferences, <laughs> not you know, uh, committing anything on it. But the way that was done was simply by taking not the absolute value of visitors per city, but taking the difference in the percentage of visitors and then plotting that as a hit. Okay, that's available on uh, blog.grammar.com. I'll point you to the reference towards the end. Now we have added one little uh, twist to this, which is as you hover over these cells, it will tell you. So for instance, about 500,000 visitors came in at Tuesday at 10 a.m., which lets you play around with the metrics, see what's happening, <coughs> and so on. The way to do that is really straightforward. I'm not going to go through the, actually walk through the code here, but you know, you just, uh, anytime you hover over a cell, you find out the position of the cell, and then you know, move it a little bit so that you don't block the mouse, and display and set the text for this hover element, and position it there, and show it. That is pretty much it. So about uh, 50 lines of JavaScript, and that's an example. We have not used SVG, we have not used Canvas, we have just used divs, we have barely used jQuery, we didn't need to use jQuery. The only thing that we've used is this gradient function which I'll quickly walk you through, and you'll find that it's fairly basic. There's one helper function that converts numbers like FFFFFF, to 2 root by 2 root by 2 root by and we have a gradient function that does the following. So so 
if you say gradient of 0.4, sorry for those at the end who can't read it, uh, let me just talk you through it. Uh, if you say gradient of some number and you specify an array which says for 0 it represents such and such a color, for 1 it represents such and such a color, it will just interpolate the values linearly in between. There are far more sophisticated ways of doing it. There are good color models that one can use, but doesn't matter. You can, with visualization, you have a lot of leeway. You can afford to get it wrong in many, many ways, and it will still be all right. You can also try very hard to get it right and still fail. Both are there. So that uh, brings me to the last segment of my talk, which will take a couple of minutes, in which I'll show you a few things uh, that we've done, uh, except that I'm not connected. We are doing all this at the client end on a browser okay. and the examples you gave had relatively small data sets. What about the uh, processor complexity when you have really huge data sets which normally is the case for uh, data engineering? Sure, so the question is uh, uh, what if there is large data and the browser can't handle it? Um, the browser can't handle it, the browser can't handle it. Right? See, I just be, see. He, he's also from Libya. Right? So our typical data that we look at is uh, 200 billion records and uh, about 50 terabytes of data per day. Yes. And there is lot of wealth of information that we can mine and visualize and generate trends. Right? Yeah. Uh, any All reasonable, time. humanly possible way to do it in a... Absolutely, uh, but not on the browser. So if the question was, if we have about 200 billion rows of data, what can we do with it? The answer is nothing on the browser. Uh, a 10 second plug here. So the company that I'm with, uh, Grandma, what we do is handle on the server side, massively large data sets. The technology there is custom built server that we've got that produces output in the form of HTML or JavaScript. Now this is an example, for instance. Uh, this is a network of uh, GitHubers in Chennai. So literally, it's a somewhat larger data set and I'll show you some other large data sets. But the way it works is, uh, anyone who's following anyone else on GitHub, they're one connected component. Now, that's the network in Chennai. I have decided to settle in Bangalore. I am not exaggerating, but truly for this reason. Oops. This visualization... I mean, that lead to uh, sort of the implications. And firstly, the network is twice as large and the connected component in the center is also more, uh, is a significantly larger percentage. Uh, but the thing is, this sort of thing, which involves a reasonably large amount of data, can be handled on the browser. I have uh, up to a million rows, I don't even think twice about on the browser. But it, it's only when it starts getting to tens of millions of rows that you start worrying. At that point, it needs to be done on the server side. But to be fair, you have two bottlenecks. It is not the processor capacity often that constrains you. It is often the bandwidth. If you have to transfer a million rows, it's going to take a long time. You don't want to do it, you want to summarize it. And if you're summarizing it, then there are a couple of ways of doing it. One is, so let us say you want to create a graph like the one that I uh, showed uh, here. Okay, now the number of data points here is massive. But you don't need to show all of the data points out there. You, if you're showing, interested in showing the correlations, compute the correlations on the back end, send the data to the client and represent it on the client. That's one possibility. The other possibility is generate the full XHTML file on the server side and uh, display it. Both options work. We've tried both, no issues with either of them. Another area that I thought I'd uh, share with you is mapping, or actually sort of one of the quite an interesting application <coughs> that we shall have first. Uh, we were trying to see who the fastest one day transfer fell. And didn't want to take a lot of time doing this, you know. Just wanted to see the entire history of one day uh, interactions, which incidentally if you take an excellent printout is about 150 pages and see what can come out of it. That's roughly what it looks like. The size of each of the boxes represents the number of runs that players score. The color indicates how fast they score. So, can you tell me who would have, who's the fastest? A free. And how long did that take? And who scored the most runs? <laughs> you don't really need this to say that. But also, you can zoom in a little more. So, really has been doing great, yeah, but let's look at his individual matches. So, that was uh, 124 at a whopping 206 strike rate. 143 against Sri Lanka. It provides you that drill down capability as well, and clicking clicking on it will take you. Oops, clicking on it will take you to the match 
that he was created and you can see the statistics and so on. Like I said, about 150 pages worth of information that can be compressed into one shot. Again, here, absolutely no uh, fancy uh, libraries, nothing more than plain HTML and JavaScript. Uh, another is maps. So that's a simple map tool where you have every state in India. And let's say I want to change Andhra Pradesh is slightly greenish. Let me make that red. And Assam is somewhere in that range as well. Let me make that red as well. So I can just put in numbers or copy and paste this into Excel, copy and paste it back, and you've got the data plotted on a map. And it's not restricted to the state map. You can have the district map, or you know, let's go to the districts within a particular state, and so on. Now, what's happening here? Nothing more than one SVG file, which you can control through JavaScript. On change, or on key up, whatever you want. Find the item, change it. The possibilities are limitless. Since we don't really have much time for libraries, I'll just mention one library that I think stands out about the rest. We've talked about, you heard three we mentioned, Raphael, Protovis, and D3. Protovis' successor is D3. And therefore, between Protovis and D3, you don't really have to think twice, it's D3. And between the, uh, Raphael and D3, also you don't really have to think twice, it is D3. There is today one library that is clearly going to win the race for uh, JavaScript, at least for the next one year, without doubt. The way Mike most of the who uh, authors it is going, it, it, will, it is already something extraordinary and will continue to be something extraordinary for a long time. I think it will get to the place where jQuery is right now without any competition. The library's name is D3. The uh, coder network thing that you saw, you know, the social network virtualization, that was done using D3, for example. But you don't necessarily need to use it. There are some complex visualizations that makes life that it makes a lot easier. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one thing more important in visualization is if you have static uh, way of visualizing. That is, if you are always plotting runs against uh, Paul's face, <coughs> that wouldn't actually be helpful for decision makers. They would want to move around the axis, move around on what you are looking the data at. So, <coughs> so the question was, uh, how do we help people who want to play around with the data? So does D3 uh, help that? Uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but let me answer the question uh, first at the business level, which is, there are two kinds of people. People who want to play around with the data and people who want to see the results of the data. Okay. And the two are completely different audiences. Uh, visualization is something that is a visualization is really a presentation layer. Analytics is what helps you find the answer. And the people that are doing these two jobs have a very distinct tool set. So the, your question was, will D3 help me explore? My answer is yes, but I would not suggest it. If you are using SAS or R for instance, you have a far more powerful tool to do data exploration. If you have Excel, you have a far more powerful uh, tool for doing uh, data exploration. Once you know that this is roughly what I want, then you spend a few minutes thinking about what's the best way to picture it. No. Which is where a library like D3 will help. But just have a look at the interactive capabilities at D3. It will, it can do enormously, it, it, it can do a lot. No, no, no. Uh, is uh, the predecessor to the D3 as well as Tab, which is interactive visualization. Uh, both of them are offshoots of uh, Stanford University experiments, computer science experiments. So you seem to be fairly um, uh, advanced, you seem to have fairly advanced capabilities in uh, your company. So do you plan any uh, tools or set of uh, wrappers around the existing tools uh, uh, that, that would be available to the community? Uh, question is giving it back. Yeah, Pay so what open source uh, tools are we going to develop? Uh, the India district map that you saw, uh, that's uh, the only uh, district map that is available uh, in that conforms to the 2011 census. Uh, that's uh, open source and it might licensed via BSG, MIT, and incidentally the WTFPL license for those of you who know who want that license. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is an example. Uh, we are planning to build a series of tools. 
Now, the, where we are struggling with this, uh, to build something like Tableau for instance. Tableau incidentally is uh, an exploratory data visualization tool. You can do a lot of drag and drop and create some really amazing visualizations. Uh, the trouble with creating something like Tableau is it caters to an audience that has a rough idea of what they want, how to create visualizations and so on. See, we found that you can create extraordinary visualizations using Excel. You can create extraordinary visualizations using HTML. The reason why people don't do it is not because the tool is capable, the reason is because the people are not capable. So, in order to create an end user tool that creates great visualizations, we have to get over the hurdle of that training. We've given up, or not given up. I mean, that's too ambitious for us to start. We are focusing on small domain specific tools. Map, very straightforward. So, then we created a new construct called a calendar map, in which, uh, let me not go into it, but it's, it's a new type of visualization. And that's something we've got a tool to pair on with that will be live soon. We've got a uh, new construct called a cluster scatter plot, which actually you saw the uh, hierarchical visualization cluster. Uh, this one. Now, we've applied it with uh, good effect in a number of cases. For instance, we went to a telecom company and said, look, take all your products, plot it this way. And they said, hmm, that's interesting. I've got one product at 111 MRP, which is very tightly correlated to the 89 rupee MRP. Then they think about it and said, of course, the two are up to 100, as well, 200. So the guy comes in and uh, gives a 200 rupee note, uh, chop people won't have change. So these <coughs> makes a lot of sense for them to be complementary for us. So which means that if you push the, if you do any marketing on the 111 rupee MRP product, it will automatically increase the sales of your 89 rupee MRP product. But at the same time, it is uh, conflicting with uh, your uh, 222 rupee MRP product because roughly similar price point, roughly similar proposition. So they could see if you have, if you do any marketing on either of these two products, it's going to kill your slightly larger product, larger both from a price point perspective as well as from a volume of sales perspective. So and so that was one example. Another example, we took this and analyzed competition. How much of your traffic is going to competitor A versus competitor B and so on. So if your traffic with competitor A rises, test traffic with competitor B rise and so on. And you can almost see that the world of mobile telecom is grouped into three types of uh, segments. One, CDMA operators. Two, GSM operators. And there is one company which I will not name, which is a bit of a young company, which is completely distinct from all of these. I mean, this tool really helps you group together uh, various kinds of uh, anything. Here we are grouping securities, you can group products, you can group companies, whatever. So this is another tool that we are trying to get out as an open source tool. Uh, so we are doing a bit of it, but the thing is our aim is not to create a general purpose data visualization tool that anyone can use. It is to bring more of uh, more components uh, into the open. So you had a question? Uh, this would have to be the last question for running short of time. Okay, when it, when it comes to performance, which path is better, SBG or Canvas? Um, <coughs> canvas, but uh, there are two reasons why you wouldn't want to go for Canvas, which is simply the primary one being, A, if you try taking a printout, the resolution will fail you, and if you try zooming in, the resolution will fail you. So, and also actually thirdly, if you want to interact with it, you can't interact with an element in, in Canvas as easily as you can. So I, I hover over an element. I don't have an object to attach an event handler to to see what that is or grid now. So for all these reasons, SVG has sort of become the de facto standard uh, in terms of uh, implementation. So with that question, let me just end up with uh, how you can reach me, uh, which is on my site. You can just Google SRM. Uh, I'm going, it's anyway lunchtime. I'm going to be around and for the rest of the day. Feel free to reach me with all my contact information on my website or right now. Thank you very much.